You know, there are a lot of things that seem obvious to those of us who have worked in medicine that may not seem so obvious to those who haven't. Here are five things that laypeople don't know about medicine. To start, medicine does not have all the answers. So it's obvious that we don't have cures for things like cancer or dementia, but when you go to medical school, when you earn your MD, you realize that there are so many things that we don't have clear cut black and white answers to. A lot of medicine is actually in that gray area. For instance, there's still a ton that we don't know about the brain, including the cause of some common diseases like Alzheimer's. Even the answer to seemingly simple questions, things like, is red meat bad for you, is a bit more complicated than a simple yes or no. Yes, but actually no. Bruh. And although we've made significant strides in the field of medicine and new research and medical knowledge is growing faster than ever before, there's still just so much that we have no idea about. As Aristotle once wrote, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. This brings me to my next point, which is that doctors aren't experts in all fields of medicine. To become a board certified doctor in a given specialty, you first go through med school and then residency. So although med school provides doctors with the tool set, the foundation to understand medicine as a whole, they obviously are not experts in every field of medicine. And depending on what field of medicine you specialize in, you may end up forgetting many of the things that you once learned in med school. Although there are some specialties that retain more of that knowledge from med school than others, things like family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, emergency medicine, these deal with all body systems and they treat a wide variety of patients. A lot of other specialties are much more narrow. But of course there's a trade-off, right? So if you're seeing a wider variety of patients and diseases in different organ systems, then you don't tend to have the same depth of knowledge in any one system as those who specialize in just cardiology or just gastroenterology. Conversely, doctors that specialize in only one area of medicine may end up forgetting much of their knowledge of how to diagnose or treat issues of other body systems. For example, a doctor who's been practicing dermatology for a decade is probably not the best person to ask about how to manage your blood pressure or your diabetes. And that's just the nature of specializing as a physician. You'll learn a lot about your particular field, but you'll also forget a lot of the information from med school that isn't really relevant anymore to your field of practice, or rather less relevant. But you have to remember that one's expertise as a physician isn't just based on their education, but also on the individual. Because some doctors are gonna treat medicine like a job, and they don't care as much about staying on top of the latest medical research and developments outside of their field. On the other hand, you have doctors like Peter Atia, who went to medical school and gained that foundational medical knowledge, but didn't finish residency. So on the surface, it may sound like he wouldn't be the first person you'd go to for medical advice. However, after his general surgery residency days, he focused his efforts on longevity medicine and is now recognized as one of the world's leading experts in the field. So although specialty will largely dictate a physician's area of expertise, individual differences can play a massive factor as well. All right, number three, this one might be surprising to some of you, but most doctors receive very little training in nutrition. Many of the leading causes of death in the United States can be traced back to dietary factors, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes. Despite this, nutrition is not often a priority in medical training. According to a 2015 study, U.S. medical schools provided an average of 19 hours of nutrition education with a median of 17 hours. Over a third of schools required 12 or fewer hours of nutrition instruction, and nearly one in 10 medical schools required none. Damn. This always seemed so backwards to me because diet and nutrition are such important parts of our health and well-being. Now, I was fortunate to have gone to a medical school that did provide a greater emphasis than most on nutrition, However, I still had to learn much of what I know through my own research, partially because of being a health obsessed nut ever since high school, and partially because of my IBD diagnosis when I was in college, I've spent countless hours learning about nutrition and trying to optimize my diet. I've lost count of the number of nutrition papers I've read, I've done so much experimentation with my diet, a lot of trial and error to figure out what works best for me. And one tool that has been incredibly helpful on my nutrition journey is the sponsor of today's video, Levels. Levels is an app that uses continuous glucose monitors to show you how your diet and lifestyle affect your health in real time. It allows you to track your blood sugar automatically and see exactly how it changes throughout the day. This has been a huge game changer for me as it's given me a way to objectively assess how my diet and lifestyle affect my metabolic health. If my exercise is off or I don't get enough sleep, I can actually see it reflected on my blood glucose levels in real time. This holds me accountable and it motivates me to get back on track. And it also allows me to take a more personalized approach to my diet. We often hear about how foods are either good or bad based on their glycemic index, but how foods affect your blood sugar is actually highly variable depending on the individual. So one food that causes you to spike may not cause me to spike and vice versa. By seeing how foods affect my my blood glucose minute by minute, I can tailor my diet to me and my unique physiology and make better, more informed decisions about my health. The old thinking was that blood glucose monitoring is only for diabetics, but Levels is helping to bring the technology to the masses. I've been using Levels almost every day for over the last year, probably more like a year and a half plus. 
because I just find it that valuable. Levels has been an awesome partner to this channel and there's a reason I continue to use them to this day. If you sign up using this link, also down in the description, you'll receive two months free when you sign up for an annual subscription. Thanks again to Levels for sponsoring this video. Number two is that antibiotics can actually be harmful when they're used incorrectly. The discovery of antibiotics was arguably one of the greatest medical breakthroughs of the 20th century. Prior to the discovery and widespread use of antibiotics, infectious diseases were a leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Conditions like pneumonia or or tuberculosis, which had incredibly high mortality rates historically, are now very much treatable due to antibiotics. It's estimated that the average life expectancy in the developed world has increased by approximately 20 years due to the discovery of antibiotics. That's wild. Now that being said, antibiotics are not the magic bullet for every illness that a lot of people think they are. And there are actually a lot of issues when antibiotics are used inappropriately. Antibiotics are only indicated for treating infections caused by bacteria. They're not effective for infections caused by viruses or fungi. Despite this, many people think that anytime they get sick, they need antibiotics. And this is problematic for several reasons. To start, when you have a cold or other upper respiratory illness or URI, the antibiotics, they're not gonna work on viruses. Bacteria are single-celled living organisms. That means that they can create their own energy and reproduce on their own. Viruses, on the other hand, are not living organisms. They cannot create their own energy or reproduce on their own, so they require a host to reproduce. Viruses infect our cells and use the same molecular machinery that our cells use to replicate their DNA and RNA to create copies of themselves. Now, since antibiotics are designed to target bacteria and not our body's own cells, they are ineffective against viruses. Antibiotics can also be harmful to our gut microbiome. Now, as we've discussed in previous videos, our gut is home to trillions of bacteria. And although we often think of bacteria as bad, these microorganisms actually perform a variety of important functions within our bodies. They help us digest foods that we can't break down ourselves, like fiber. They create important biomolecules that we can't make on our own, things like vitamin B12, vitamin K, and a variety of essential amino acids, which are the ones that we can't create ourselves and need to get from our diet. Good bacteria also protect us against more harmful bacteria by competing for resources. They can help stimulate the immune system and protect against cancer cells and pathogens. They're also implicated in mental health and behavior. Antibiotics can harm the good bacteria in our gut, which can negatively impact all of these functions. And lastly, there's a growing concern regarding antibiotic resistance. Like all living organisms, bacteria have the ability to evolve. Every time a bacteria replicates, there's a chance that a small mistake is made during DNA replication. We call this a mutation. Although these changes are random, they have the potential to benefit the bacteria. If they're beneficial for the bacteria, then there's a higher chance that the bacteria will survive and replicate and pass on those new genes. So whenever you take antibiotics, you're creating an environment that actually selects for the trait of antibiotic resistance. If a bacterium happens to have a mutation that allows it to survive in the presence of that antibiotic, because now it won't have to compete for resources with other bacteria, it'll be able to survive and replicate, leading to a population of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And if that wasn't bad enough, perhaps even more concerning is the fact that bacteria possess multiple mechanisms by which they can actually share genetic information with other bacteria. So that means that the trait of antibiotic resistance can be passed on even further. This is why you should avoid taking antibiotics when not indicated. If we continue to use antibiotics when not indicated, we risk creating a bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics that we won't be able to treat. And this brings me to my last point. Now, I occasionally read through the Fat Fire subreddit, and I've noticed a lot of wealthy people asking about extensive yearly testing and whole body MRIs to make sure they're catching things early. Now, this may sound like a good idea, but you ask any physician and they'll tell you, hell no, that is, avoid that like the plague. Although advancements in technology have greatly improved our ability to diagnose and treat diseases like cancer and heart disease, overdiagnosis and overtreating are problematic as well. In medicine, there's often much more uncertainty than people realize. If you find something on a scan or a lab test as a doctor, you have to work it up and you have to follow through with it. The problem is that many things that show up as abnormal and require additional workup or treatment end up turning out to be completely benign and they were asymptomatic to begin with. For instance, some masses that are picked up on scans may have the differential diagnosis as cancer, and they may turn out to be harmless. But despite this, if you see an abnormal mass on imaging, then you may need to biopsy it. And depending on the location of the mass, you may have to do a pretty invasive test that has its own set of risks as well. Now, this isn't to say that you shouldn't get screened or that you shouldn't seek treatment when abnormal findings come up, but rather things aren't always black and white. It's important to understand the risk profiles of both the abnormal finding and the treatment. For instance, when I was deciding whether or not I should get the COVID booster, there were some people who were advocating that everyone should get it, and then there were others who were saying that no one should get it. In reality, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Once we had the data, I was able to look at the risks of getting the vaccine for someone who's in their early 30s, few comorbidities, pretty healthy, 
and not getting the vaccine and what the possible uh, risks are of getting COVID. Again, for someone who's in the early 30s, few comorbidities, pretty healthy. And with that, I could make an educated decision regarding what was best for me. As I always say on this channel and on Med School Insiders, it's my favorite word ever, so I'm gonna say it again. It's important to understand the nuance so that you can make better and more informed decisions. Let me know with a comment below, what did you think of this video? Do you wanna see me make more videos like this one? Check out what people don't know about doctors or this other video. Much love my friends, and I'll see you guys in the next one.